Welcome, everyone. Um, we're letting everybody in. We'll take another minute or two to make sure that everyone is coming in, and then we'll start our program. Thank you for coming. Okay, I think we will start. We have reached almost 300 people and I think we'll let the others join us as we start. So first of all, I wanna say shalom to everyone and welcome to the first lecture in 2021 of the Ghetto Fighters House International Online Series Talking Memory. My name is Medin Shachar and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and an educator. I want to welcome our global audience from over 35 countries, including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums, institutions and centers, and an especially warm welcome to the survivors and their families that are with us today. We want to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. We have some incredible programs coming up in 2021. So watch for them via our Facebook page, our website, and if you're here today, you'll receive updates through our mailing list. And I wanna send out a special thanks to our partners today who helped to make this program possible. The Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum and the USC Shoah Foundation. So before we start, I'd like uh, to give you a few housekeeping notes. As you uh, probably know already, you can notice that the lecture will be recorded and you will be available within a day or two on our YouTube channel and on our website. So we will post a link in the chat box for our Talking Memory uh, YouTube channel. As you can see, we have put all our participants on mute in order to avoid unwanted noise during the program. But you can use the chat box to say hi, as I see some of you are doing, and also to send questions that we can ask at the end of the program. We will also be posting our link to register for our upcoming program next week on Sunday, January 24th, marking the International Holocaust Remembrance Day and the 60th anniversary of the Eichmann trial. Our special guests will be Professor Hanna Yoblonka and Dr. Tamir Hod for a conversation on the topic between Eichmann and Dimyan Yuk, two Holocaust trials in Israel. And now, before I continue, I would like to invite Igal Cohen, the CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, to say a few opening words. Igal. Thank you, Medin. Shalom and welcome to the first Token Memory Program for 2021. We are honored to bring this program on the dimensions of testimony together with our friends and partners, the Dallas Holocaust and Human, Human Rights Museum and the USC Shoah Foundation. I would like to personally thank Stephen Smith, Mary Beth Higgins, and Max Globin for the contribution to this most important subject and for taking part in the program today. I also want to wish Max a happy 93rd birthday, Mazal Tov. I'm looking forward to learning along with, a, with our global audience about the future of Olka's testimony with our very special guest, wishing everyone a meaningful learning experience today. Thanks. Thank you, Igal. Um, and I also want to wish Max a belated uh, happy birthday. His birthday was, he told me it was on January 14th. And I see Mary Pat has already put up a heart and that's wonderful. Anybody else that wants to add a heart or a happy sign, please, you're welcome. I think we're celebrating, can I say 93rd? Right? He doesn't feel 93. 
Okay, so we're gonna start our program. Uh, documenting Holocaust testimony has evolved over the past 75 years, and this technology has advanced. Thousands of survivors have been able to leave a tangible legacy. Still, the ability to give a live testimony in front of an audience has been one of the most effective ways for survivors to share their difficult stories. As more and more survivors are passing, we find ourselves standing at an inevitable crossroad. Dimensions in Testimony is an initiative of the USC Shoah Foundation with the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center with technology by USC Institute for Creative Technologies and concept by Conscious Display. And the DIT is, its goal is to record and display testimony in a way that will preserve the dialogue between Holocaust survivors and learners far into the future. Many museums such as the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, our partners today have embraced this technology in order to eternalize the testimony of survivors from their own community for future generations. In this program, Dr. Stephen D. Smith, the Finsey Viterbi Executive Director of the USC Shoah Foundation and Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights uh, Museum, We'll discuss the cutting edge new technologies in storytelling and virtual reality and how they are being implemented in the, mu in the museum space today. We are honored to feature special guest Max Globin, a Holocaust survivor from Dallas and one of the participants in the Dimensions in Testimony program. We'll share his thoughts on his personal virtual testimony experience. We begin today's program with Stephen and I would like to give a short introduction um, and then we're going to go to a quick clip and then we'll start our program. Besides being the Vinci Viterbi Executive Director of USC Shoah Foundation, Stephen holds the UNESCO Chair on Genocide, edu uh, Genocide Education, excuse me. Smith founded the UK Holocaust Center in Nottinghamshire, England, which I have visited and it's incredible, and co-founded the Aegis Trust for the Prevention of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide. Smith has served as a producer on a number of film and new media projects, including Dimensions and Testimony and the VR project, The Last Goodbye, which I recommend seeing as well. In recognition of his work, Smith has become a member of the Order of the British Empire and received the Interfaith Gold Medallion. He also holds two honorary doctorates and lectures widely on issues relating to the history of collective response to the Holocaust, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And welcome once again, Stephen. It's wonderful to meet you. But before we start our talk, we're going to take a take a clip to, that discusses a little bit about uh, dimensions and testimony. So we type. The Holocaust is an undeniable and horrific chapter in human history in which six million Jews and countless millions perished in genocide and crimes against humanity during the Second World War. Dimensions and Testimony is a new format of interview by which you can ask your questions of a Holocaust survivor who has videotaped answers to many questions so that the questions that you have will be answered directly in person life size and TV. What was life like before the war? I had a very happy childhood. I loved to be together with my family. We understand very well the power of conversation between Holocaust survivors and the younger generation. We've seen it in our schools, we've seen it in our universities. That conversation, that moment of dialogue where I ask my question and I get it answered, is just a, a, it's magic in the room when that happens. And we wanted to try and find a way to preserve that as best possible. What's wonderful about conversing with these Holocaust survivors in this interactive form is that it's, it's about you, it's about what you want to know. Conversation allows you to, to learn in a way that most suits your interest. And that's where the deepest learning takes place. Do you feel hope for the future? I always feel hopeful. If I wasn't hopeful, I wouldn't be talking to you or anybody else about my experience. I'm very happy that I was able to survive. And here I am. I was one of the lucky 
The questions that students have is what's driving the learning experience. And so we know that this is important because we're going to enable them to be able to learn through their own curiosity. We are almost out of time to have deep conversations with Holocaust survivors. If we don't have these conversations now, they will never take place. Okay, so I think um, I, I want to go back for a moment when I went to the uh, National Holocaust Center, I think it was in 2015 or 2016, and someone from the USC Shoah Foundation came to talk to us about new dimensions in testimony back then. And I, you know what, I said, that's a great idea, very imaginable. I, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It sounds so beyond what I could imagine as a testimony. So I was talking with some people and I was thinking, where does the idea come from when you, when you uh, this genesis of this new format, this new dimension in uh, testimony? Um, and how is it different from what we are used to, the conventional forms of giving testimony? Well, Medine, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. I want to acknowledge all the Holocaust survivors that are on here today as well. Uh, I also want to just say, um, you know, it's fantastic to be with you today, not least because my journey into learning about the Holocaust began at Loch Geta'ot and Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Um, you know, nearly, nearly 30 years ago, I sat in your archive and rifled through all of the, the wonderful um, um, things that you have there. And also, it was right at the time when you were forming Yadli Yeled. And I was so um, impressed at that moment about how important it is to bring our the story to younger to younger learners. And in a sense, I think this is a continuum of that. Um, what I saw in Yadli Yeled, you know, 25, 30 years ago was that you were, you were immersing your visitors in the history and allowing them to explore the history. And in a sense, this is a testimony format that, that draws off that exact same learning methodology. It's about curiosity. Actually, it began nearly 10 years ago, um, Heather Mayo, who is now my wife, at the time was not, um, and I were at Yad Vashem, and we met there, and um, she was doing a project on intergenerational testimony, how it gets passed down through generations. My own PhD uh, was on uh, the issue of how testimony changes over time, and one of the things that I came, came to was the fact that dialogue getting into conversation is so really important. And on the, uh, I see today on our Zoom, we have Henry Greenspan. Thank you, Henry, for introducing me to that concept for your work in the 1990s um, on listening to Holocaust survivors. And so I was pursuing my work around conversation when Heather said, you know, um, Holocaust survivors won't be here. And the conversations that we're having now in classrooms um, across the country and across the world, and this amazing engagement that we have by which the things that are most on our mind get answered, won't be there for my grandchildren. And I, at the time I was actually working at the National Holocaust Center in the UK, and I had observed that when Holocaust survivors who came in every day to tell their test, to give their testimony to the students, when they'd finished their, whatever it was, 45 minutes of com, you know, presenting their testimony, the hands would go up and questions would be asked. And I never once heard a question along the lines of, let's just say, take Max's story, um, what day were you deported from the Warsaw Ghetto? Was it the 13th or 14th of May? Um, those weren't the questions that were getting asked. The questions that were getting asked is, do you believe in God after your experience? Did you seek revenge? How do you feel about racism in the world today? The questions were all about the consequences of what they had just heard. And yet when I was looking at the testimonies that we have, and you know, today we have thousands and thousands of testimonies, which do explore many issues like that, um, they're never asked in that way. And so when Heather came up with this idea of why don't we put the questions to the survivors that young people ask, um, it didn't take as long to come up with a list of about 500 regularly asked questions. Um, and so we started the project to try and research that. On our Zoom call today, I also see in our guest list, Pinchas Guta. 
um, who you just saw in that film a few moments ago, also a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, like Max Glauben, um, and it was a call to Pinchas um, sometime in 2011 to say, Pinchas, would you mind coming to Southern California to the Shoah Foundation? I just have a few hundred questions to ask you, um, which started this project going, and uh, he was, in fact, the first interviewee in this holographic interactive project, and thank you, Pinchas. <laughs> he is the pioneer, isn't he? And for the, the VR program as well, he's also included in that, which I highly recommend, The Last Goodbye, which is another stage in um, bringing uh, a virtual space that is a real space to people that maybe can't get there or won't be able to visit. Yes, actually, it's, it's good that you mentioned that because these are both new technologies. And it's really important to stay for everybody on the call. Um, <laughs> this is not a technology project. We are using advanced technologies. We are inventing technologies. In both cases, uh, Dimensions in Testimony and The Last Goodbye, it was the first time the technologies that are used in those um, uh, testimonies were ever used for anything ever. Um, so we were on the, on the bleeding edge of technology. But I remember sitting in the room somewhere in around about 2012 maybe with I don't know, a dozen scientists from the University of Southern California, and they were telling me about all the various technologies we could use. And, mm -hmm. and Heather and I sat there and said, I'm really sorry to tell you, this isn't a technology project. This is a testimony project. And the most important thing here is, what are these important people who have experienced this history and have got to say about it? And what emerged, at, emerged out of that, Madine, was um, because we put testimony first, what we ended up with was um, these very large uh, data sets of uh, testimony. For example, if you go to the archive and you, uh, you know, look at Max Glauben's testimony, I think it's around about three hours, this original testimony. Um, he spoke for five days for dimensions in testimony. Pinkus Gutter's testimony is two hours and 20 minutes. He has over 20 hours of testimony in dimensions and testimony. So in fact, these are enormous testimonies in which because the questions are coming from a whole variety of sources, um, every question you could possibly imagine is getting asked. Uh, and so they're able to talk about a much wider range of topics. And so therefore, we see these as almost like databases of answers to questions that the survivors gave, which then you access by asking the video questions. So there's nothing actually too fancy about this. It's just a, an access platform to get at the questions that they answered um, so that you can uh, find the things that interest you most. It's almost like you're saying that that fourth wall is broken, that wall that maybe the, uh, a, a person wouldn't ask a question of a live survivor, but maybe they'll ask the, the virtual. Uh, that was I'm one of the, sure, but... in fact, was one of the outcomes. I remember being at a, um, an event in, um, in Britain, actually. Um, and a journalist from uh, Germany came in and she was talking to Pinchas Gutter. The, the, the dimensions and testimony version of Pinkas Kutta and asking him some questions. I, I, was, I didn't sit in with her. Um, she was in with some sev several other people. And as she came out, she said to me, thank you so much for this opportunity. I said, fine, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. She said, no, no. She says, this is a reset for my life. And I said, what, what do you mean? She said, well, I grew up in Germany um, and I was always afraid to ask the really difficult questions about the Holocaust. Why did it happen? What does it mean? And how do you feel about me? That is, as a German person that grew up in the 60s and 70s. And she said, Pinkus Gutter gave answers to those questions that I would never have dared asked in real life. But I feel like I can sort of reset my thinking about my identity from this moment on. Um, so that was really, really interesting to hear. Wow, that is, that, 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 that's another, uh, another addition, right? another bonus that I didn't even think about as far as, you know, because you do put the learner first. And I think that was said in the, the clip as well. So that makes it different. You, uh, I'm curious how many uh, survivors actually took part in this project. I know two, <laughs> maybe three. Yes. I think we're, but, at 30, uh, we're at 34 right now. Um, 30. Yes, we're currently working with the Sydney Jewish Museum. It's interviewing one survivor every two weeks. So it's one week on, one week off, and they will have six additional testimonies in Sydney. Uh, for our Australian uh, partners. Um, we've also started to interview in different languages, Nadine. So we've um, interviewed in um, Spanish with our colleagues um, in Mexico and in Buenos Aires. And um, we've uh, interviewed 
in Russian. Uh, we have two Russian testimonies, which are really, really remarkable. Um, we also have one testimony for our Hebrew audience. Get ready for it. We do have one in Hebrew, which is on its way. Wow. Uh, we interviewed um, Ziggy Ariav from Tel Aviv, um, who, and his testimony will be with you in Hebrew shortly. Um, so it's really great to see these different language groups coming up. In addition to that, although we haven't um, extended to genocides other than the Holocaust dramatically, the Shoah Foundation does cover over 10 genocides in its main archive, as you might be aware. Um, but the only one that we were able to do that was pressing for time was actually the Nanjing Massacre, because obviously the survivors of the Nanjing Massacre are of similar age to the survivors of the Shoah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we interviewed a lady called Sha Shukin. Um, she was, um, uh, she's from Nanjing, China, and she came to Los Angeles for a week. And just a month or two ago, we interviewed one of the very last comfort women um, that were uh, subject to sexual violence and sexual slavery during the Japanese occupation of uh, most of the Far East. Um, and there's only literally a handful of them alive. Um, and so we've been interviewing in Mandarin um, for those interviews. Um, we would anticipate in due course that we will start to do similar types of interviews uh, for uh, survivors of more recent genocides, but of course many of their um, survivors are younger and we want to give priority to the Holocaust survivors to make sure that their testimonies are documented while we can. Right, so that was actually <laughs> gonna be my next question. Going beyond uh, the museum space, where do you see dimensions in testimony going? What's the next uh, dimension in uh, this platform? We had a very nice launch recently um, with the Patriots football team, NFL football team, um, around, <laughs> veterans, around Veterans Day, where they wanted to introduce a Holocaust uh, testimony to their community. And what we were able to do include, because of the situation around COVID, obviously it wasn't possible to go to the stadium and have events or whatever. So in fact, uh, we did an online exhibit with two survivors, uh, one of whom is a veteran, um, actually not of the, of the um, Second World War, but of the Korean War. So he's a Holocaust survivor who then served in the American military. Um, and um, we have actually interviewed as well, um, a liberator, wonderful man by the name of Alan Moskin and keep an eye out for that testimony also okay. because it gives a gives a very interesting perspective on the Holocaust but um, the, the Patriots put that on their site it's called uh, Together Beat Hate and it's a program they're running through um, the Patriots organization to encourage their community to tackle racism and intolerance um, in sports um, and so the featured um, featured program for Together Beat Hate in the fall was uh, dimensions and testimony interviews on the on their website and so what we're able to do now is start to find ways to introduce these testimonies not only in the museum context but for specific education programs that meet the needs of different organizations and uh, you'll see now if you go to the Shoah Foundation's eyewitness website right. that you can actually find some programming in fact Pinkus Kutter again uh, I want to say the pioneer we'll say the guinea pig Pinkus um, is once again the guinea pig there uh, where his testimony is available, but you'll find other testimonies now being introduced to eyewitness to enable learners in classrooms, particularly with the distance learning that we're experiencing during COVID, to experience these testimonies firsthand. Well, that's going to be very interesting because I did meet Pinchas, the DIT Pinchas, and it, it, it really needed a lot of technology, a lot of equipment for us to meet him here in Israel during a conference. So I understand that it's actually become much more available through voice recognition through your own computer or in the classroom. And that's very exciting to hear about because I think that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this program with the uh, USC Shoah Foundation and the uh, museum in Dallas is to kind of get the word out uh, since in Israel, especially in Israel, we don't have this uh, technology yet, but we will soon, I understand. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I think want to, yes. Oh, yeah, sure. So we're all gonna say is that, is that when, when we filmed these uh, interviews, we did so with what they, what they call future proofing. Um, the idea is that you try and take, to do the filming in such a way that it's not linked to a particular platform or a particular channel or a particular way of viewing it. But actually what we do, we collect all the data in a way in which it can be used in multiple different variations. So for example, augmented reality was not really a thing. Um, five years ago when we started this project, it is now becoming a thing so that you can place 
um, you know, an, an object or an interview into a space that you are, are inhabiting. So if you imagine in future, it'll be quite possible rather than having all the big screens that we have right now um, in our museums like they have in Dallas, there'll be the opportunity, for example, to be able to place Max's interview, for example, in a classroom in the um, uh, in the in the museum, using glasses to view it rather than a big screen. So it, it's very, very adaptable. And that's how we wanted it to be so that as technology develops and accessibility develops, the testimonies can still be delivered to different user groups in different places. Well, thank you, Stephen. I think this is the perfect time to invite uh, Mary Pat uh, Higgins to join our uh, conversation. Um, so I'd like to invite you to unmute. Hi. Hi, and Andy. just a short introduction so everybody knows who uh, Mary Pat is. Um, so first of all, uh, Mary Pat earned a bachelor's degree, and here we go, in accounting from the University of Texas in Austin, is a certified public accountant. <laughs> I have one in the family too. And is a graduate of Southern Methodist University's Cox School of Business Executive MBA program. As president and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, Mary Pat Higgins leads the museum in its mission to teach the history of the Holocaust and advance human rights to combat prejudice, hatred, and indifference. Under Mary Pat's leadership, the museum underwent a significant transition as it moved from its transitional location to a new permanent home, Mazalto, which opened to the public on September 18, 2019. The new state-of-the-art facility, which I can hardly wait to see, accommodates an expanded core exhibit and a large volume of visitors. Additionally, it enables the museum to grow its education program. The vision for the new museum includes a broadened perspective with exhibits and narratives focused on human and civil rights, pluralism and diversity, and other genocides, in addition to the history of the Holocaust. Mary Pat has been a longtime advocate for children in educational initiatives. Prior to her role at the museum, Mary Pat served as associate head and chief financial officer at the Hockaday School in Dallas. Outside of the museum, if she has time, <laughs> Mary Pat is active in the greater nonprofit community of Dallas and has served on the boards of Oak Hill Academy, Preston Hollow Presbyterian School, Planned Parenthood of North Texas, KERA, the Dallas Women's Foundation and the President's Visiting Council of Austin College. She currently serves on the board of the Ursula Academy, Visit Dallas, co-chairing the Cultural Tourism Committee and North Dallas Bank and Trust. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank goodness. Thank you, you Nadine. It's a joy to be here. Um, I just, I am so grateful for the opportunity to speak about this incredible project and I look forward to coming back to the Ghetto Fighters house. I was yes. able to visit my first year when I was at the museum a little over eight years ago. So it's a wonderful place. And thanks so much for inviting us to partner on this today. Thank you very much. So of course, uh, my question is, is okay, new vision, new museum, and now this new technology. How did the how did you get to this decision that yes, we need to also have dimensions in testimony at the museum? Well, it's a great question. It's something that we dreamed about early on. I, you know, I think Stephen said this started evolving dimensions and testimony 10 years ago. We started plans to build the new museum eight years ago. So we learned about this project early on. But at that time, it was such an audacious dream and goal to raise enough money to build a new museum. You know, we were one of the very first Holocaust museums in the United States. Um, I think it's pretty incredible that we were founded in 1984 in Dallas, Texas, and there were only 125 Holocaust survivors in Dallas at that time. So they, and Max um, was one of those founders. So they did something very visionary. Um, in 2005, we moved downtown Dallas and um, had a very small 6,000 square foot museum. So the goal of, of building this new state of the art permanent home was a pretty big goal. Uh, we had a small budget. We, we really had a small group of supporters. And so initially we didn't have the confidence to add dimensions and testimony to our project but we continued to monitor it as we were designing and building the museum. 
Um, and I have to say, you know, it was an opportunity of a lifetime for me. And you shared with everyone that I'm started my life as an accountant. Thank goodness I, I discovered work that is um, so deeply meaningful. <laughs> I, I still love a good spreadsheet, but this is, um, <laughs> but this, you know, is really making a difference in our community. It's impacting the behavior of the students who visit our museum. Um, and so as we started building this exhibit, um, really from the inside out, we were working with Michael Berenbaum um, and Eddie Jacobs on the design and Michael kept coming back to one of the, the presets or you know, foundational guiding, um, guiding um, goals of this exhibit was to rescue the individual, to personalize it, you know, the six million is such an amorphous number and it's a statistic, but students learn best from um, thinking about the impact on an individual. And so we built in short clips of survivor testimony throughout our Shoah exhibit using a lot of the original um, USC Shoah Foundation testimony. And then when we decided, we got to the point that it became clear that we could raise that little bit of extra money to add this theater, we went for it. And mm -hmm. you know what's amazing is um, it, we had one ask. Um, Max has so many people who admire him, and um, you know are just in awe of him in Dallas. That we went to a family to ask if they would support adding this theater and and allowing us to film Max and. They said yes, but you know, before they even left the room, um, so it was the easiest money that we raised, and um, I know that they're proud, and we're incredibly proud. I, I also remember I was telling Max before before everybody came in uh, that uh, I remember meeting him uh, when I came many years ago, and I was also very impressed by his story. Um, so I understand why Max would be a choice. Are there other stories that you're adding to? The museum besides Max's? Well, you know, we came to this process a little bit late in the game. And, you know, as, as Stephen said, part of the sense of urgency now is filming survivors while they are still able to share their story. We did have um, a number of other survivors who had, you know, very unique and, and, and you know, interesting, if, you know, albeit horrific experiences. But, but sadly, many of them had already passed away when mm. we were able to raise the funds to enter into this project. Max was a natural for us um, though, because as you'll see shortly, he's so vibrant. He is um, 93 years young and um, his mind is like a steel trap. He remembers you know, every street in his Warsaw neighborhood. Um, and I don't remember, you know, the street down the block from me today. Um, he went to five different camps. You know, he, he started at Majdanek, one of the major Nazi death camps. He was on a death march um, to Dachau. He had, he witnessed the Warsaw ghetto uprising. He saw so many unique and, um, you know, consequential things that we really felt like he had the most to offer. You know, he had the most content and such a vast um, diverse experience to share with our community. And lastly, I just say, you know, for 30 years, Max had been touring all over Texas and the surrounding states. He's a rock star. Um, and we knew from, from that history, how powerful his testimony was and what an impact it had on the people who were lucky enough to hear from him. And how was it to work with Max in this new technology? We're going to talk to Max about that afterwards, but from your end, suddenly he's not just giving a live testimony in front of an audience or going from school to school, but actually sitting in this crazy green area in this chair. Yeah, all it, over. you know, <laughs> I, I mean, you will, once the audience gets to visit with Max, with Max, you'll be able to envision that it was a delight. Um, it was an incredible opportunity to be able to sit in on a few of the days and watch Max being filmed and, and being asked these questions. And, you know, I, I think I've always been in awe of, of Max, mostly for his sunny disposition and his, you know, his hopefulness and his resilience. But 
I being in that room and listening, you know, to 40 hours of, of, of him Incredible. recalling, you know, with such great accuracy and um, emotion, you know, the, these life events just um, was, I can't even express what an experience that was. And really one of the most delightful things that I've experienced ever in my life is seeing Max ask himself questions and get a kick out of, out of his response. <laughs> <laughs> that's very <laughs> I can imagine that but I think that um uh, that it's definitely uh incredible to to see someone like Max to, to just embrace this technology and say okay and like Stephen said it's the point isn't the technology it's the testimony and leaving a right. legacy so in the end it's just another way to get to the end you know, it means to the end that's right. um, so I think, Mary Pat, maybe we should <laughs> introduce Max. Um, just a few words, Max. I think that uh, Mary Pat already said a lot, but I just want to say a few words about uh, who you are, and then we're going to invite you to come join us uh, for this conversation. Um, oh, wait, actually, before we do that, I think we're going to do uh, one more thing, right? I think Stephen has to join us again. And before we meet with uh, Max Globin, we're going to meet with uh, DIT. Yeah, Max. Sure. So right. what I'll do, I'll very briefly just show you what it was like for Max to do this interview. Um, if I just go here for a second, I'm going to share this. Um, this is uh, this is Max being interviewed. You can see he's in a green room, um, surrounded by cameras. You can see at the front here, there's two little cameras. In fact, I think there's a dozen or so around him, um, capturing him from all directions. Um, which would look something like this when seen on screens, um, because we capture the images from all directions. Um, somebody was asking about the, you know, um, the ethics around um, taking holograms. Just to let everyone settle everyone's mind at rest, hologram is just video, but lots of it. Uh, we're not recreating anybody. Nobody's digitally recreated. It's just normally we use one video camera. In this program, as you can see here, Max had about 16 cameras around him collecting data from all sides. So there's nothing make believe about this. There's no digital recreation. It just gives us the opportunity in future when screens will allow us um, to be able to see that in a more vivid way than we would do on just a single screen. Um, when it gets produced, this is how it looks. You can see there in the studio, uh, this is Max actually at the Dallas Holocaust Museum there um, on this little stage. And you can see that he's life-size sitting in his chair, um, ready to speak to the students and then the, the um, actual still um, cinema looks like something like this. Um, it's, it's always difficult to photograph in a dark room when you've got a, a light source. He, he doesn't look like a ghost when, he's actually, when you're actually in the room because the human eye is much smarter than the camera um, and it can dis define the different, discern the difference between different light sources. Here you see him as rather bright and ghostly because it's uh, the way the camera reads the room. You'll also see on the screens here on the side, these little blue screens, um, in the introduction um, to Max's testimony, we learn about his story. And in fact, the whole room is like a big projection room and we're able to learn about from him using his voice from his testimony about his story so that when uh, students begin to talk, they have some context. And that was a good question that I think Leah or Emily asked a moment ago about context and how do they ask questions uh, without when they don't have context. Um, they get provided with context, either in the cinema here in Dallas or online. Do I just come out of this for a second if I figure out how to do that? Um, I'm Stephen, gonna... I'm going to interrupt you. That picture was of Max's family seeing this experience uh, for the first time. Uh, and, I see and it, some... it brought tears to his wife's eyes. It was amazing. Yeah, I see that some of the Glavin family are on, and thank you for loaning uh -huh. him. To... Uh -huh. very uh -huh. um, so I'm just going to go back and share screen again and just show you what the finished uh, product looks like here. So uh, obviously I'm sharing this on a computer screen um, and we're not seeing it life size and it's rather sort of small in the black space, but usually this would be um, experienced as a full screen. Let me just check this is working. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. It's going, to, it's going to be a little slower than normal, obviously, because we're using Wi-Fi here and Zoom. So we've got two, two uh, inhibitions, inabilities to, to give you a really smooth experience. But I'll just ask him a couple of quick questions. What is your name? My 
my name is Max Globen. Max, what do you want us to learn from your story? Would you like to ask? What do you want us to learn from your story? Treat everybody around you the way you like to be treated and respect them for who or what or whatever they are. <laughs> Why is it important to tell your story? It is my belief when people are listening to us and it is my belief that the Holocaust survivors that build museums and educated millions of people that through this endeavor we hope that the Holocaust didn't repeat itself and hope then why people are watching it that maybe this is a much better world than it was during the period of the Holocaust. <laughs> so that's um, just um, two answers of about 850. Um, I'm <laughs> sure if you want to ask him more, you can go to the, to, uh, the Dallas Holocaust Museum and do so. Um, and just as I hand back, I just want to say to Max, thank you for taking the time, Max, to share your story and to make yourself available to tell that story for future generations. Thank you. Back and to you. he is. And uh, I see that uh, Haley is trying to get in, Haley Globin, but hopefully she'll be able to connect. So I was going to ask one more question of both of you, Mary, Pat, and Stephen, as we're looking at this, um, uh, what do I call this DIT uh, survivor, Max? How, how is it being utilized in educational programs? Like, like you said, Stephen, it's going to be going out of the museum at some point. And for Mary Pat, it's actually in the museum still. But what kind of educational programs do you do before or after meeting uh, a DIT survivor? Um, Either one. Stephen, I'll jump in and I, I'd love to start. Um, you know, we're, we're in a... A different time right now because of the pandemic and, right. and our students are coming to the museum virtually but but pre pandemic and hopefully very soon post pandemic. Um, students will come to the museum for about three hours and so people that were worried the question earlier about context is is not a concern because they will have gone through the entire permanent exhibition and learned. Um, the history of the Holocaust and, and actually heard some of Max's testimony in films and, and interactives throughout that experience. And, and we'd love to get those students particularly to come to the Dimensions and Testimony Theater and have the opportunity then to ask Max questions. It's ideal if, if our visitors can go to the theater after they've gone through the Holocaust exhibit they have questions you know, about history. They have questions that, about Max's experience that they just learned about. And um, it's really fascinating. You would think that the students who are so tech savvy would sit in the room and think, oh, this isn't real. But it's so obvious by listening to them that they get caught up and they feel like they are speaking to Max. And, and just as Steven said, you know, they ask him questions, you know, like, did you ever smile in the concentration camp? Did you have friends? Um, wow. Did you, do you forgive the Germans? And it's just incredibly meaningful in that context. 
Okay, thank you. I understand. I'm working in a museum. I definitely understand what you're saying. You know, there's a whole process, a whole teaching uh, process that the students go through or the visitors go through. And are you saying that they always get to the the IT Max at the end of the program, or is it mixed in at different times? It, kind you of know, from running a museum. Right, from running a museum, it's it's a big puzzle getting large groups of students through. So it doesn't always work that way for students. Um, we we try to make that possible. But regardless of the timing of, of when they get to see him, um, they're learning while they're at the museum, they're immersed in learning the history of the Holocaust. And, and this opportunity to learn from Max's personal experience just makes it a much richer learning experience. Uh, can I just share screen with you for one second, um, yes. everybody? Uh, just to show you here, if you don't have an eyewitness account for the Show Foundation, I suggest you get one. I'm just going to show you where this is. Um, it's eyewitness. You can see up here, letter I, witness.usc.edu. We're going to put this link in the chat in just a second. And you can see here, this is the first online activity we've done with Dimensions in Testimony. And you can go here and you can follow this once you're signed up. Um, and when I resume testimony, because I've actually done the first part of this, um, I will come to a window here where I can actually uh, speak with Pinchas Gutter. So um, it's worth, for those of you who are teachers or interested in this, um, there is lots of contextual material around this that you can, you can find here. And you can see Pinchas there, and you can even type in uh, a name, uh, type in um, as well as ask, um, using the voice recognition. So if I just type in, what is your name? Hopefully I'll answer that. Um, oh, yeah. he's answering, yes. he's answering, he's answering but I think my, uh, my uh, sound is not connected to this. So um, that's just one thing you could do. The other link we're going to put into the, uh, into the um, chat is for the Together Beat Hate program, where you can see what a public program looks like <laughs> online. Um, I would just say one final thing on this, Medine, and that is that, mm -hmm. Doing this online does not replace the experience of being in a museum where you have the benefit of being there and in, in, immersed in the content with the guides, the fully immersive experience. And, and in fact, we were not going to put this online um, until COVID um, you know, got the better of us all. And then we decided we were going to accelerate that program, but we don't just promote the testimonies without context everything is always contextualized. And so it'll be possible, for example, for the museum to be able to publish Max's testimony, for example, on their website in, in future or to have other ways of being able to share it. Thank you both so much. Now we're gonna introduce the real Max. <laughs> Max, <laughs> I don't wanna take too much of your time. I'm just gonna say a few words. Uh, Mary Petter also uh, introduced you quite well, but I have to say, uh, Max is a Holocaust survivor uh, uh, of Dallas and is recognized across Texas and the nation as a passionate advocate for Holocaust and human rights education. He was born Moniak, Moniak Globin in Warsaw, Poland in 1928. Now we really know your age. He had a younger brother and two parents. His father owned a Yiddish newspaper called the Tajblat. Das Yiddische, Yiddische Tajblat. Tajiblat. He and his family were already living within the boundaries of the Warsaw Ghetto when uh, the uh, ghetto was closed and he was there also during the uh, uprising. But before that, uh, Max and his father started smuggling items in and out of the ghetto. And uh, as Mary Pat started to describe uh, during the 43 uprising, Max and his family went into hiding for several weeks, but they were eventually found by the Nazis. And these are all things that can be discovered by asking questions of DIT Max. Uh, they were deported to Majdanek. On arrival, his mother and little brother were sent to the gas chamber and Max and his father were transferred to Mujin labor camp where his father was ultimately murdered. And these are also subjects that will come up if, if someone asks the DIT Max, the, the difficult uh, situations that Max um, also experienced. Um, I'm going to stop here. You can learn more about Max's story. It's available online. Just Google. It's an incredible story of survival. I want to get right in and say shalom and hi to Max and actually let Mary Pat and Stephen, who know him better than I do, <laughs> kind of uh, jump into the conversation and uh, talk with Max. 
Let me say something. Shalom. Yes. And I do want to recognize a person yes. that made a theater possible in the Dallas Holocaust Museum. And uh, the best, to my knowledge, it's the only museum that has a theater for the dimensions. There's one Is other, Max. Huh? We're the second. We're the second? Yes, sir. But anyways, all this has been done in the new museum, and it's in a theater where people can actually come in, sit down in a chair, and stand up and ask them. Max, I've heard you you say this, but I'd love for you to share with our audience what it means to you to be a part of this project, to have, have your testimony live on for generations to come. I have uh, many, many ways of explaining this, but I'll try to do a short rundown. I was orphaned and I was hiding in the Warsaw ghetto and they found me while it was burning and took me to Majdanek. When I was liberated, a United States second lieutenant picked some of us up and I lived with the army, with the United States army as an employee he gave us uniforms and I lived there from 1945 to 1947. I learned how to speak English, how to drive, how to do. And I was a mess sergeant for Polish guards and German POWs that were assigned to that company, the 179 Signal Repair Company. But anyways, I was lucky enough as an orphan, I was brought to the United States by the U.S. Committee, and I was sent to New York to an orphanage, stayed there, didn't like it, went to Atlanta, turned over to Jewish Children's Service. In 1951, I was drafted into the U.S. Army, and then I served to 1956. When I was released in 53, after two years of duty, I married Frida and I had uh, three beautiful children, seven grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, and it comes to this time. But the moment I got to Dallas after being in Fort Hood, Texas, in the army, I started dreaming about the Holocaust Museum. Now, if you have a Ford car or something that's of lesser value than a Cadillac, your dreams are smaller. And when we started, we were nobody and we were dreaming small, but eventually we got up to dreaming a little bit higher and we were accomplished after 40 years, an $80 million museum that is one of the finest. And I said that it should be like a car cleaning for a person. You would go in the front door and you'd come out a clean, good, standing upstander on the outside. I was approached a few years before, well, before the dimension came to Dallas by Mary Pat and an education director. And they asked me, would I be willing to be interviewed for this? And what I thought in my mind is, can anybody imagine the value of the Shoah Foundation project? Number one, there were articles about me that I will live forever. 
but those thoughts were not in my mind. But what made me do it is that I have the ability to remember up to the smallest thing and describe items that would look in somebody's mind like they see a picture of what is happening. And the more I talked, the more pictures came out. And I said to myself, you know, Moses got to the Mount of Sinai and God gave him the Ten Commandments. Look what came out of the Ten Commandments. Look at the world we're living in. And there I was with all the knowledge in me. And I was spilling it daily to everybody in one hour. How much can you get into the one hour of explanation of how you feel and how you were treated? And we were brainwashed. So I decided to spill the beans any way I could that they would be used in educational ways and teach the people that we have both sides. We have goodness and we have horror. Isn't it better to show the horror? So I, that was my feeling and can you imagine that after I'm gone, my great grandchildren and anybody in this world can go into our museum or maybe another one because these uh, things are transferable. And if they want to ask a question and not only get a true answer, but made them witnesses because we were witnesses to the Holocaust. And every time you talk to a Holocaust survivor, you are made a witness. Max, can I ask you just for the benefit of everybody that's joined us today, what was it like for you to do that interview? Just tell them about what you did and what the routine was like and what it felt like to, to complete that task. Do you want, you, the way I can describe it is you have a job and you are an individual. You control, you bio. When you have a job, it's like you have chains on there. You have to get up in the morning and do your job and do the things. When I sat down in that chair and I made up my mind, I'm going to spill the beans. I said, there it goes. <laughs> and I, went, the more I started releasing the pressure that was inside of me. Do you understand? Any bitterness that I might have had against somebody else went away. But I tried to do away with that because I'm one of those guys that studies yourself and I'm considered mechanically inclined. <laughs> Hate eats on you, not on the person that you hate because they don't even know that you hate them unless you tell them so. So it grows in you the same way as if you bake a loaf of bread and put some yeast into the dough and put it in the refrigerator, it grows by itself. <laughs> you don't have to do anything else. So that's how it works on you. So I decided in order so maybe I live as long as Moses, 120, get the hate army, let it eat on other people, 
and not on me. So anyways, when all this kept on going, when you talk about one thing and you have a memory like me, I noticed that something else was happening at the same time. So that's why I had so much to tell. And there were certain abuses that you get in your life. It's a secret if it's done by somebody that maybe you know, or somebody maybe you don't know, but you're embarrassed for the people to know it. Mm -hmm. So while I was there, I noticed some, and I asked them, should I tell it or should I not tell it? Because if I didn't tell it, then I might be a liar, you know, and why didn't you tell it and all that? So in an easy way, I told it, but I made 14 trips back to Germany and to Poland and to Israel. And I have a relations with Flossenburg, Germany, the camp that I was in. And I verified it one time when I was there with my son about one abuse, but I didn't want to mention it to anybody. But in the Shoah Foundation thing, I mentioned it. So it's like a release. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it also does me good that I can pay back, back all the goodness that was done to me through my life because without parents and without having a family for backup, I was able to survive all these years to today and have a family. And I know that I was liberated as one individual, but now if I make a reservation in a restaurant, for any birthday or what, it amounts to more than 20 people. So do you realize what the liberators have done? And that's why we are so grateful to the liberators and to the United States Army that liberated us. Thanks, Max. Again, Thank I don't much. think we have enough time. No, we're fine, we're fine. Help that what I express is a true way of, of all the things here. I think more than anything, what you just said, Max, really um, brings the point back to what Stephen was saying. It's all about the testimony. It's not about the technology. And I think I personally have gained a lot of uh, knowledge uh, and I was very skeptical. So I think that uh, listening to Max has helped me to understand a little better what the perspective is, is of the survivors. And I have to say one thing, Max, before you go on, one more thing, okay? I have to mention this because I did not mention this and you didn't say it. So I'm going to say it, that in 2019, my sir, you were named Texan of the Year by the Dallas Morning News, one of the most distinguished honors in the state for his unceasing calls to resist hate, stand up for others, and strive for peace. So, and at the same time, at the same last time. year, That's I became a doctor without the doctorate education, and I got a doctor of human letters oh. from SMU University. Wow, and that's wonderful. Since I'm I like, have so such a great audience, I want to say one thing. I had a young lady that four or five years ago, her name is Jory Epstein, and she, for love of writing, got next to me, made two trips with me, and wrote a book, and it's called The Upstander. It is coming out on March the 23rd, 
of this year, and uh, it's published by Post Hill Publishing. And if anybody wants to really see my story in the background of what was happening, they would be thrilled to probably read it and purchase it. And that's, a, that's available on the website, right? I think I saw it's it right there. Now Amazon has a pre-buying pre can be done right now. And uh, there are many books already on all that. And oh. I hope we, then we know how much to print. And I didn't look at the camera, so everybody you, camera. you were perfect. You were perfect, everybody. So I, I wanted close. I want to say thank you, first of all, to Max, and thank you for your family for joining us as well. And thank you, Stephen, and thank you for monitoring the chat <laughs> along with um, our uh, people in the backgrounds. Thank you for answering everything. And Mary Pat, thank you so much for sh for sharing with us your experience. How do you produce some, how do you take a Max Globin and <laughs> bring him into the museum as uh, a part of the Dimensions and Testimony uh, project? And Max, of course. Uh, he, brought, he brought himself in. Exactly. That's what I wanted to say, that you were not alone. You had, well, how many were there? 30 other survivors that helped start the movement that led to the creation of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. I remember when it was just a dream when I went to visit, and I'm so glad that it finally came to fruition. And we can hardly wait to visit. All the Holocaust survivors all over the world. <laughs> and shalom to some of my family, Nachmanis in Israel. Ah. So let's make this a better world. Absolutely. Max, I want to say mazal tov on your uh, honorary doctorate. Yes. Uh, for those of us who do have PhDs, we know that you did it the hard way. So very, very well deserved and very proud of you and just love knowing you. And I want to sh say, I know Mary Pat and I will both share this, that we're going to treasure every word that you've shared with us and we will play it forward for future generations and we will treasure it because uh, you've given us such a big part of your life and it's deeply appreciated, I'm sure, by everybody on this call. And that gives me the greatest Thank reward you. and pleasure. Thank you. Well said, Stephen. Thank you. Well said, Stephen. Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Um, I want to thank, again, the two uh, partners in this amazing program, as well as Max, the uh, USC Shaw Foundation. Thank you so much. And Stephen, thank you for your innovation. And I want to thank Mary Pat Higgins again, the uh, director and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum for sharing uh, your experience and, and creating this beautiful space. And Max, once again, we all want to thank you and we honor you. We honor you for telling your story and telling us all the, the bad stuff and getting all that hate out. I think that was probably the most impactful moment when you were sharing your story today. Thank you. And the, this whole thing was a surprise to me. All I was told is I was going to say a few, <laughs> answer a few questions. But thank you very much. And thanks for Shoah. You know, and. OK, so I want to say uh, goodbye to everyone. It's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening here. It's already nighttime. And uh, we will have a recording. I think all the questions about that have been answered by uh, Amy and Annie. So um, thank you again for visiting. Hope to see you at our next program next week on the 24th. And thank you all again. And Laila uh, Tov, we say good night. V'shalom. Laila Tov. Shalom. Thank you so much, Maydeen. Oh, Bavakasha. <laughs> Have a good afternoon, Max. Shahati Harbe, Abalami, Mavin, a lot. Mavin, Bavakasha, Yofi. As I said, Maxim, I said, Madim. I'll send you guys the chat as well so you can see some of the things that were yeah. written. Oh, so now people are saying Todaraba, Max. In Hebrew, now that you said that you speak Hebrew. Hello, Mary Pat. 
Hello, Max. It's and good to Annie see you Black, today. Are you on there? Thank you. Annie Black's here too. We love you, Max. The same goes here. I got more than I expected. <laughs> and I'm, 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 I'm real happy. I'm glad but, to hear that. I think that over oh. and out. Should... <laughs> yeah, you, it's okay. I'm just going to let Max know. I'm going to send him an email. I think um, I'm trying to figure out what I would send, but I think uh, maybe some pictures. It's, it, it's yes. Do you oh, know my. Email? I will send you by email because you wrote to me. Um, we got um, a photographer named Chuck Fishman that took some screenshots of you and he sent that to me now. So I'll pass oh, it good. on to you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Chuck, if you're still here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All okay. right. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, everyone. You bye too. Bye. I'm going to sign off so everybody is now leaving. Okay. Thank you again, Max. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.